Thank you so much for coming here. And, you know, in L.A., it's not really easy to get around. So I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to be here. And I just want to say thank you so much for, to Dr. Sadegi. He is my family doctor, but also just such a busy man. And to take time out of your day to come here, I really appreciate it. Sure. And for Thanks. some of you that don't know, Dr. Sadegi is... Um, Sorry, I'm looking at my mom and she's like so emotional seeing me up here, but <laughs> I can't look at you. Um, Dr. Sadegi is the founder of Beehive of Healing and LoveButton.org, and he also is the author of two amazing books, Within and The Clarity Cleanse. And he's an amazing integrative medicine doctor, and I've had the pleasure of working with him, and he has completely changed my life in a number of ways but um one of the biggest ways is i was not fertile when i went to see him and now i have a baby so it's really amazing what he's done for me so thank you in the context of your husband yeah <laughs> no. <laughs> no. but um but yeah i mean you really worked i mean you look at he looked at my blood work and he immediately like we worked together as a mentorship program and he worked with me on mental health and of course like nutrition everything mm -hmm. about that but i mean you are definitely the the really the whole package mind body soul everything is together and you can really read blood work and see when someone is having issues up here and it's not external and i think that's really important and there aren't very many i feel like there is no one that can do mm. that um so yeah i just you and so anyways i was working on the saffron latte which is why we're here mm -hmm. um the fullest first product which we're really excited to launch and to have you guys here to learn more about um but i was working on this on the side and we had never spoken about it no and um and meanwhile like i had my baby and a couple years has gone by since i first started concepting this product with my mom and a couple people from our team and then I shared it with Dr. Sadeki, and he was just like, what? I can talk about saffron for days. Like, I can literally talk mm -hmm. about saffron. He said this, eight days straight and only take a break to go to the bathroom. Like, right. that's it. Right. And I was just like, I knew that, you know, the universe brings us together for a reason, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so it just felt so right to share this information with all of you guys and with people who are watching this, um, that will be watching this. It's, it's really incredible to me that there isn't, I mean, there's a lot of research, mm -hmm. which is so amazing to refer to, but then there's also this like historical usage of saffron that's so that dates back to forever ago, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you know when, mm -hmm. and that people intuitively have been using it. And um, being Persian myself, like my mom always would have vials of saffron water, like um, infusions, and would be like, don't drink that because you're gonna have like a giggle attack. Like don't drink the whole right. thing. And then I'd be like, I'm gonna drink the whole thing because I'm obsessed with this stuff. And I don't know what it is. And I was like five. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, like maybe as we get started, you can share with sure. us a little bit about the history of saffron and, and how people and cultures have used it forever. Sure, yeah, I think the history um, of saffron goes back to Hippocrates, really. Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and medicine your food. When you think about it, if you've ever um, eaten Persian food or any food from any country that they have what's referred to as a system way of approaching medicine, such as Indian food, right? Or in, in the Orients, as you're sitting and you're eating, there are herbs in between that you're eating, right? These herbs are, are the very herbs that now we think that uh, we just discovered them and we turn them into essential oils and we've turned them into mother tincture and we drink them. So um, this idea of using saffron or an herb, it's really profound. And in order to create the context for you, I would like you to understand that I'm a medical doctor. I'm a family practitioner. And, um, but I have an interest in mind-body medicine. And what that 
means is that I have a master's in spiritual psychology and I've spent over 11 years of my life being mentored by uh, John Tabakin, who uh, was one of the deans of the largest psychoanalytical institute in Los Angeles. So why am I saying that? I'm saying that because this whole world of mind-body, one of the herbs that you use to soften up the if you would, the curtain between mind and body is saffron. Saffron has been used for decades, uh, centuries, as, um, as anti-convulsants. Now, you may not know what an anti-convulsant is, but you know that really one in three kids right now, they're having convulsions. They have seizures, and they put them on significant amount of medications and so forth, where, believe it or not, saffron uh, was used um, generations ago as an anticonvulsant. And what it does is it softens up the flow of electrical activity in the nervous system, in the neurons, so that you don't get, in French, they refer to it as uh, um, spasmophilic, spasmophilia. So a sp spasmophilia, it could be manifested as a person who has a stutter, Okay, a person who has a stutter simply means that if you look at a toothpaste, they're squeezing the toothpaste tube at the wrong end. They have a lot to say. There's a lot of toothpaste to come out, but they just can't get it out. Okay, so if there is a way that you could soften this end and squeeze towards the end, all the toothpaste comes out. That's what saffron does. Saffron calms down. It's, it's what's referred to as neurocalming effect of saffron. It's been known for centuries, and they use it. Now, what makes it so unique, you know, when you look at the whole field of chemistry, chemistry didn't, wasn't started because um, we needed chemicals. Chemistry, the whole field of chemistry was started because we needed colors, and, and we're in a uh, you know, in a space that color obviously is very important because we know that color shifts and changes our feelings, our thoughts, and our emotions. So when, when they wanted to, like for instance, color purple, they say, well, color purple is the color of royalties. But wh why? Why was that? Because when you think about it, the only way that you could get color purple was from sea turtles. So in order to go down the sea and get the turtles, bring it out, and to extract that color so that you could now paint the robes of royalty. Only royalties could afford that, you mm -hmm. see? So saffron, you may have seen, obviously now they don't use saffron uh, as, the, uh, as the pigment to, um, you know, to, to, if you would, to color the fabric for the monks. But, uh, you know, uh, monks uh, uh, in various different parts of uh, Asia, they used to have saffron color um, gear because it spoke of their stature and the years that they have invested in cultivating their consciousness. That's what it signified. And um, it, it just, it is the largest, um, you know, it is the most expensive herb. And what makes it more expensive, it's really the way that it's cultivated. You know, you may not know, but um, a pound of saffron can go up anywhere between five to $10,000. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to a saffron, you're like, well, it's not that expensive when I go get it. Yeah, you just pay $25 for, for 0 0.06 ounce of saffron. Trust me, that's, that's $7,500 per pound. That's what you're paying for. And most people, they don't, they're, they're not aware of it. When you look at most, uh, most countries that they have a systematic approach to medicine, the way, that they, the way that the medicine works is they treat medicine as a conversation. What is your name? Carson. So if I want to ask Carson to get up and to sit there, I can shout and, you know, she will get up and she will sit there. But the Carson that might get there and moves there, she's like, oh my God, she's nervous. She's, she might even feel that, well, gosh, how did I speak? How did I dare speak with her that way? She's going to be completely disengaged with me and the world around her. So that's really the issue with medication that I have. Now, remember, I'm a family doctor, meaning that I have prescriptive rights. I don't throw away the baby with bathwater. I'm not against medications. But medications, if, if I just start by just whispering, you know, Carson, I, I wonder what it would look like for you to be sitting there. 
right? And then I, gosh, I, I, you know, really consider what I'm asking you. And I just move in that direction. Really, screaming should be the last resort. But the medical model, the way that we practice it has been such that screaming has become the first model. See, if you look at the, our culture, it's really a culture of anti, right? Antibiotic, antidepressant, anti-inflammatory, anti you name it, right? So, but this approach and the reason that, and by the way, I'm not getting a penny for, for being here and for everything that I'm doing. I'm doing it simply because I believe in her and I believe in the cause, because if this can be provided as a product so that people can use it as a way of treating their, do you understand the amount of money that is, is, is spent on pharmaceutical medicines just to treat irritable bowel syndrome, just to treat what is referred to as premenstrual syndrome, which really a combination of things uh, involving normalizing hormones and, and cramps and feeling ill and so forth, right? It's, that's the solution for it. You know, most people, they're not aware. I can't tell you how many people that they're completely vegan, that they come in and they're going blind and they don't realize that they've contributed to their optic atrophy, that that's the reason that they're going blind. And, and then you tell them, look, if you really are against any of the animal products and so forth, okay, let me just introduce you to saffron. Saffron is one of the greatest sources of B12. Now, uh, yeah, I've studied B12 really well uh, because, as, as Nikki mentioned, I wrote a book, and the base of the book is based on a diet that's referred to as intentional unsaturation diet. This is the Clarity Cleanse. The Clarity yeah. Cleanse, which is based on, um, I'm giving you choices, right? I'm, I'm giving you the two S's. So I would go, I, I went to today's show, I went to here, and Megan Kelly and everybody, they were, I mean, the minute that they read that the IUD, uh, the intentional unsaturation diet was based on sardine, they were like, Ugh, sardine, I'll never eat that, right? So I said, oh, well, hold on. So if you're looking at B12, yes, sardine has, per ounce, has highest concentration of B12 amongst many things. But if you are specifically interested in B12 and you're vegan, saffron an incredible source of B12, but no one tells you. You always think like, well, you know, it's, it's a little herb and it makes things yellow. If you want the yellow rice, you know, when you go to a, a Persian or Mediterranean re uh, restaurants, usually when they serve rice, the white rice, the basmati rice mainly, they get a little bit of saffron, right? And, they, um, and what they do is they make a little tincture and they put some of the white rice, right? They mix it and then they spray it on top so that when they serve it, it's like, wow, it looks really elegant. Mm -hmm. That you just think of it as, you know, as a, as a, um, if you would, a coloring herb. But that's not it. You cannot believe how many people, I mean, you were kind enough to share and based on that, and I want to give you the privacy and the dignity of your space. But a lot of people, they come in and they have what's referred to as a thickening of the cervical mucosa, N not the cervical area here, but the cervical inside uh, the, uh, the pelvic floor. And the, the thickened mucus, it prevents the movement and the flow of sperm. And that is the number one cause of functional infertility. But no one really looks at that. Can you imagine having a latte that is based on saffron first thing in the morning mm -hmm. or, or really paying attention and when you are ovulating, you'll do that if you are planning to, to have a baby instead of just rushing to the nearest fertility clinic and being pumped up, okay, with all these medications that yes, they'll get you pregnant, but the downstream effect is that cancer, uh, weight gain, right, and various different things. Now, please keep in mind, I'm not against anything, right? I'm wearing a love button. <laughs> I'm pro everything. What I'm bringing forward for us as a very intentional healing community to consider is the idea of being able to think through your life. And instead of, you know, doing something because Dr. Sadegi said so, it's like actually think about it. You know, one of the things that, uh, that you asked me was, could you, could you present the research? I said, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. Of course. And, you know, the intent is 
to publish uh, the, the article that I wrote on saffron and to hyperlink all the all the research. That Dr. Siddiqui is going to start writing for the fullest, so we're really excited, and that's what he's referring to is these right. studies. Right, right. Yeah. And, what, and, and some of these studies we've, we've, we've talked about. This was a, a, a study that you'll see that was uh, published, and what they looked at was increased oxidative stress in patients with depression and its relationship to treatment. Let me tell you what that means. The, uh, the, you, when you're looking at depression, d there is no such a thing as a cookie cutter. You can't just say, uh, oh, a person is de depressed, let's just put them on this medication. That's a very naive and reductionistic way of approaching medicine. That does not work anymore, okay? Because a per two people, three people could have the same disease, but you need to be able to treat them differently. That's what saffron does. And um, this one I love, um, and they talk about crocus uh, sativus, which is the technical nerve, uh, technical na name for saffron. And what they did was they did a double-blinded placebo-controlled co study, and they compared it to um, a Prozac. Uh, uh, as an antidepressant. And what they found was that saffron was a lot more effective than Prozac. But that's not something that you hear, you see? That's not something that you hear. The anti-inflammatory, you know, remember what I told you that I can speak for eight hours? Yeah. So this is the time no, that yeah. I'm going to come No, yeah, I'm like, I was going to say. So. <laughs> um, so speaking of it being compared to Prozac, I would love if you could share mm -hmm. specific times in your practice where you've prescribed saffron? I mean, you shared a little bit about the B12 and the, with right. the vegans and stuff, but specific times where people have come in with depression and anxiety or, um, or maybe Alzheimer's. I don't know if you've treated people with That's Alzheimer's, exactly. but yeah. what, um, at what dose maybe, or mm -hmm. what have you, you know, you were sharing different doses, of course, but yeah. I know you can prescribe medication, but um, I would love to know when you've prescribed saffron. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things that you talked about in terms of um, Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. dementia, that one of the main key medications that we have um, within the medical model is referred to as Arcept. And there is research that they looked at Arcept versus saffron. Saffron was more effective. You know, one of the things that you may not notice if you, if you have a loved one that may be suffering um, uh, with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, which is an really the devastating, right now. really an As, epidemic, yeah. it, it really is, and, um, you know, and I have theories about it and so forth, but one of the first things that they lose is a sense of smell. I've noticed empirically, and it's this: the the first thing that they stop, they cannot smell is specifically smell of. Does anyone have leather? Like this leather has real leather has a particular scent. The Alzheimer's patients that I've that I work with and I've had the privilege of treating, that's the first sense that they lose because it affects the olfactory or cranial nerve one, and. The beauty of working with saffron is that saffron is a is what's referred to as a neuromodulator. Now, you, this this word of modulator, you need to understand. A modulator is if something is high, they calm it down and they bring it down back to normal. If something is low, they get to bring it back to normal. In other words, saffron increases the buffering capacity of the body. Is neuromodulator the same as adaptogen then? That's exactly okay. right. Yeah. It acts as such as in the same mechanism as an adaptogen. Now, let me create something because what I want what I want to create for you, because when you walk out of that door, the idea is not that buy that, drink that. The idea and the reason that I'm here is that I get to share with you a different modality, a different way of looking at life. You see, um, what is your name? Chelsea. Chelsea. So let's say Carlson. Carson. Carson. So Carson and Chelsea. So they, this is this is a setup. They kept it really C's so that it'll be easier for me to remember. Thank God that I had a little bit of saffron. <laughs> so, so if let's say they go and they deflect that, this is not going to happen to you. But let's say they go and they they order food at the restaurant, you know, next building. And they sit down, they, they, they want to eat out of the same bowl, the same food, and they, let's say they use the same utensils. Let's say one of them gets sick, the other one doesn't. How could that be? 
If it's the food, and if it's food poisoning, how come one of the seas would get, uh, would get <laughs> ill, but the other sea would not get ill? See, I want you to understand that. The medical model says that it's the food, that there is a bacteria in the food that's creating food poisoning. Let's attack it. That's a that's very naive and at best reductionistic way of approaching life. I say that one of the C's that was not symptomatic, she had enough of a buffering capacity so that when the bacteria came in, she could completely give them exactly what they needed. It's sort of like we're sitting here and a person comes in and says, I want a lot of saffron latte. And we say, well, look, just go help yourself, right? <laughs> They're just going to sit there and drink all the lot. They're not going to really bother us. Now, if we don't have it, mm -hmm. they're going to create a havoc. That's what food poisoning is. See, it's not the bacteria. It's not the virus. We cannot vaccinate. Our, I'm not against vaccination. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we cannot vaccinate ourselves against every single ill on the planet. It, that's ridiculous. New England Journal of Medicine, which is not an alternative medical journal. Okay? It's one of the most conservative scientific journals. In 2002, they, they published a paper, and here's the paper. It's two graphs right next to each other. One graph the, on, on the x-axis and the y-axis. They looked at the rate of infectious diseases uh, from uh, 1950 to 2007. And you can see that the rate of infectious diseases such as measles, mumps, and you know, varicella and so forth, it, it decreased. At the same, there's another graph that the same time period of 1950, but now here it says the percentage of incidence of uh, immunological diseases such as multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, autoimmune hepatitis. The graph in the infectious disease was going down Guess what this graph, all these graphs are going up. What am I creating for you? Mm -hmm. What I'm creating for you is that we cannot live in a world that is completely sterile. You cannot protect yourself against argument. I mean, can you imagine being married to someone and, <laughs> and just not wanting to have a good argument with them? That, that's, a sterile, that's a sterile relationship and it's not going to last. You know, I've had the privilege of working with people, mm -hmm. and whether when they couple or what I'm really known for is uncoupling, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but when they uncouple. But if you create the context that you can couple or uncouple, but there is a way that you can keep your family together. Once you create that, then they invest the psycho-spiritual level of consciousness um, and maturity that's required to do the work. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. That's why we're on this little tennis ball that's called Earth, that we're rotating around ourselves and around that big giant basketball that's a million times larger called the sun. See, just because we say sunset or sunrise doesn't make it so. It's crazy. Sun is not moving. We're moving. It's actually Earth rising and Earth setting. That's what this conversation is about. This conversation is about um, having an intentional healing community that want to be creative and think out of the box and use one of the most profound herbal medicine that has been used successfully throughout civilization and now mix it with something that it's actually uh, fat based that you know if you can you can mix it right the whole idea of yeah, having it be with right was to mix it you can mix it with coconut milk or you could mix it with regular milk or almond milk and so forth see Coconut milk would be great if you go down the street, you go to uh, Cedar sinai right? The NICU uh, unit, the neonatal intensive care unit, when you cannot feed these little babies, you know what they give them? Coconut water. It's, it's basically middle chain, uh, middle chain, right? Fatty acids, which, is, which comes from coconut water. Because when you use something that is coconut based, gets where it gets right across the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, I, wa I wanted to, I, I got invited to give a talk and, uh, and I said, oh, great. And there was, um, they were very generous in terms of honor and RAM and what they were paying. But I said, I need you to understand that I'm not an advocate of what you're advocating. 
And when I told them that mm -hmm. it's ridiculous to get coconut, okay, um, based product and mix it with another medicine that we use routinely called caffeine. Mm -hmm. And you mix it and you drink it and you're like, wow, I feel really good. And I don't feel hungry. Of course you do. Because coconut crosses the blood brain barrier and caffeine is medicine. It's an appetite depressant. But what it does for you, the downstream effect is that it's squeezing your adrenals and it's actually creating adrenal fatigue. Oh, well, surely enough, they took back their invitation. And I, <laughs> and I appreciate that because I want it to be very authentic. Because I think, see, so I, coconut yeah. milk lattes. Coconut milk. You could, no. If you don't like dairy, <laughs> if you don't have access to organic yeah. um, dairy product or, you know, and so forth, that's then you can use, is, yeah. right. And that's what I really love. And I thought that it was intelligent about what you did. You didn't predetermine. You could have mixed it with almond milk or mm -hmm. soy milk. I mean, people are unaware. People, listen, you don't, you're not going to get this anywhere. I'm telling you. And I say this from a place of humility. People are unaware. There are people, it's just amazing, a patient comes in and says, you know, I started getting IVs, but I started feeling terrible. I said, well, what, what did you get? Well, I got IV of vitamin C. They say vitamin C is good for you. I said, well, what, was the, what, what did it come from? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, what's the root, what, where did they get it from? Where did the vitamin the C come yeah. from, right? What was the source? Well, I don't know. I said, well, find out. And, you know, and the patient takes back and he says, really brilliant. You know, it's a patent attorney, right? And he says, well, you know, it's corn base. I said, you know, look, let me, let me, let me create this for you. 95% of corn in the United States is genetically modified organism. Would you ever, don't you eat organic? Why eat organic all the time? I don't want any GMOs in my body. I said, well, why would you go and have someone directly inject genetically modified <laughs> organism? Uh, th that is vitamin C, but it's corn base into your body and now you are surprised that you're not feeling great. <laughs> Learn to think. It's the most difficult thing that any human being can do. Learn to think, to think for yourself. See, when you put someone, right, unless you're, you know, you want to be breastfed for the rest of your life, <laughs> you at some point need to be able to really use your jaw muscle, right? Right? That's the whole idea. Yeah. So to be able to digest, to be able to eat, to consume here, it's the same thing that you learn here, but no one teaches you. No one teaches you to do that. You see, the, part of the whole process is to really create the consciousness, the buffering capacity, the mindset. So you have this spaciousness, you have the buffering capacity to be able to relate to things differently. Mm -hmm. I, I backpacked through India. I've ate, oh my God. Uh, it has nothing to do with saffron, but I got to tell this story. No, do Listen, it. I just love just hearing him talk. It's so. <laughs> unbelievable story, right? Um, I, I meet this guy in a, in a little train. I said, Listen, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to this place, Agra, I think it was at the time, and, which is the Himachal Pradesh, which is the northern part of India. And I said, look, I'm going up there. And tell me, you're from, hey, I'm, I'm there. I said, look, I want the best Indian food ever. I said, oh, no, I can't do that to you. I said, what? He said, I, I can't do that to you. He says, what do you mean? He says, it's the best food, but I don't know if you, if you would want to eat there. I said, no, listen, I, I promise you. He said, okay, well, just come with me. So we go there, right? They were serving food in a plastic bag. Oh, my gosh. In a plastic bag. I said, wow, now I can see why you didn't want you. You thought that I wasn't going to eat there. It was the best. I mean, I'm, I'm salivating. Wow. It was the best Indian food I've ever had. I've backpacked through uh, Mexico. And I've eaten. You know, I'm not advocating this. You need to understand that I've been working with myself and with this organism inside, you know, for for over 30 some years. So it, I didn't just wake up, read a book, right? You can heal your life by Louise Hay. And then I put up a shingle and says, <laughs> guess what? I'm going to practice alternative medicine. That's not what I did. You know, the way I practice, it's really a reflection of the way I am. I live this way. I live this way. And this is really the encouragement. The encouragement is not to take your bag and start, you know, drinking your latte. Mm -hmm. This is an invitation. Mm -hmm. This is really an invitation to be able to think out of the box for yourself. And if you have children, you have an awesome responsibility for your kids. 
to introduce them to different things, you know, because to be able to build up their immune system, mm -hmm. please understand that. You have, if you're a parent, you have an awesome responsibility, right? We, we talk yeah. about this, to really introduce them. That's really what saffron is. And to, to that note, like I want to share, when I went to Dr. Saregi, I was reading everything and I was so convinced that I knew everything about nutrition and I was perfect and I didn't know why I wasn't feeling well, why mm. my period wasn't regular, I was having thyroid issues. I mean, I had so many things that Dr. Stegi was helping me with, not just one thing. It was like a whole list of things. But what you taught me and what he's been doing for us right here and sharing is really what he said to think for yourself. And that cha that's what changed my life because it was always about, I just read way too much and I love wellness. I have a wellness site, but I, what we try and do the mm -hmm. messaging and the point that we like to get across is yes, there's keto, there's paleo, there's mm -hmm. vegan, there's all these boxes that we want to fit ourselves in, but it's not going to work. I mean, if we aren't mm -hmm. flexible and if we can't think for ourselves and be our own doctors in terms of knowing what's up with our bodies and not trying to figure out what someone else told us to do. I mean, Dr. Sadegi was helping support me and he's like, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to do. I'm just going to help you think for yourself. Right? So he literally was like, go home and eat everything. Cause I was like, I'm not eating fruit. I'm not eating any rice. I wasn't even eating rice. My grandma. Can you imagine this? I'm, I'm sorry I know, to interrupt it's you. Insane. Can you imagine? I mean, <laughs> really imagine that. Listen, just think, yeah. just think. Don't freak out. Sometimes when I get excited, I, I <laughs> scream, but I'm, I'm cool. Look, listen, just think, think. You, we are a continuation of this external world. Do you understand the miracle that is? See, when you eat your steak or your fish or your quinoa, okay? Let's say you eat a piece of protein. This piece of protein, when you get it inside, you have to first be able to chew it. You chew it, then you have to swallow it. You have to stomach it. And then there is enough acidity, hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes, on and on and on and on. They, what they do is they just continue breaking things down. This huge piece of protein breaks down into polypeptide and eventually a single amino acid. Stay with me huge steak or quinoa salad okay <laughs> it becomes a single amino acid that is invisible to the naked eye this single amino acid it's going to leave the lining of the gut it gets carried and it moves on and it comes up here and there is a cell called a follicle hair cell it sits there another amino acid comes in they form a union they have a peptide bond and then another one now you have a dipeptide then you have a thousand, a polypeptide. Eventually, you're going to have a piece of protein that's called hair. What you ate externally, it becomes part of you. It becomes your hormone. It becomes your skin. It becomes your nail. It becomes your digestive enzymes. Do you see the miracle that is? See, you take in what you need and what you don't need, you excrete it. Saffron is a buffering capacity on steroids. It balances everything out. There are people that, I'm telling you, there are people that they have a functional abnormality, such as they, they're seizing, or they're stuttering, or they're depressed, okay, or they cannot get pregnant with this. And there are people that they have a structural issue that, you know, they, let's say there are certain people that they come in and they have a tilted uterus. If you have a tilted uterus, you can do whatever you want. You're not going to get pregnant because every time that you have a fertilized egg, okay, and it gets impregnated, it just sloughs off. I mean, I cannot tell you how many cases, and they go in and they do the ultrasound. Yeah, you got tilted uterus, but yeah, it's not a big problem. A lot of people, they get pregnant anyway. I mean, and it's such a subtle, you know, way that you could adjust that that what we're talking about, it's a different way of being alive. Mm -hmm. It's like, instead of wanting, you know, to, to 
latch on to someone's breast and you want to be breastfed for the rest of your life? There are people that are in their 70s and 80s and they're still breastfeeding. No. You know, I'm oh telling you. Be- no, 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 no. Hold on. Not breastfeeding physically. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about metaphorical because we've taken all saffron, right? We're thinking abstract. They're, you know, they're, they're latching on to this particular... Mm-hmm. Idea. Yeah. Idea or this particular person. You know, this person comes in and says, you know, we want to come out with all these vitamins and we want you to come out with a formula. I said, well, great. Wow, you're going to make money. We're going to make money. I said, wow, that's great. I said, here's the only problem. If you are able to make a formula that I'm going to give you that is for 7.85 billion people on the planet, then I'm on board. See, this idea of a cookie cutter, this idea that, wow, this is a super duper multivitamin Dr. Sudeikis. Wow, everyone should take it. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Don't ever buy into that. There is no cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. See, that's why the people that I've had the privilege of working with that, you know, every six months, or so they take their blood just to see what, the, what are the shifts, what are the change, how are you working with the body? Look, cancer doesn't happen overnight. It, it doesn't. Every single, today, it, we all woke up with cancer cells, but no one gets cancer. Why? Because you have enough NK cells, natural killer cells, and various different things to handle what needs to be handled. If you're in a relationship, some of us, not today, maybe last week, or was it yesterday, I can't remember, we may have had a bad fight. But we, we're not wanting to uncouple or separate or divorce or attack because you work with it, because you have the buffering capacity and you have the mental maturity to be able to think through. That was a sigh. That means I'm speaking too much. So, no, no, no. no. I, it's just, it's true. I was just sighing because it's, you. I was I'm thinking about facetious. how you've helped me in so many ways. But I mean, along with what we're talking about, yes, we're not specifically talking about saffron every single second, but it's about when we drink this or the invitation, as you yes. said, really is, yes, this drink inspired me for so many reasons, especially because I just had a baby and when I was formulating it, I was so um, amazed at how it made me feel. And I know a lot of people are susceptible to postpartum mm-hmm. depression and have gone through that. And I was in a mother mother baby group where 10 out of 15 women had the baby blues and I was like is it that I'm not susceptible or am I doing Mm. something that's helping prevent maybe that feeling and but also so using saffron as a preventative but also just knowing that I'm not trying to sell you this product to make you think I have to take saffron every single day to be happy or to be good or whatever that is because I never want anyone to feel that they have to do something Mm -hmm. because that's a place where I had been and I had come from. So that's really not what we're here to do. We're here to share about the benefits and share about thinking for yourself and what makes you feel good. And, and I truly believe that saffron is one of those Mm -hmm. medicines and Mm -hmm. herbs that is for everyone. Absolutely. And, but at the same time, like seven point, whatever billion people, but but it might not be for you. Um, but I, yeah, I'm just so curious, like, I'm so happy that you're here and we can ask you those questions and Mm -hmm. personal questions. And maybe there are people in the audience that want to ask Dr. Sadegi anything and, um, about saffron and yeah, go ahead. It's not specific necessarily to saffron, but I've been reading a lot and really interested in your ideas, like belief affecting biology Mm -hmm. Um, and our belief systems affecting our body, because I think you can also address something and you can be so convinced that it's also not working. And so then that has a you know, effect in the body that doesn't allow this buffering to happen. So I'm just curious if, you know, that idea of belief affecting biology, like I went to Morocco with my boyfriend, for example, and he is so neurotic about getting sick. Mm-hmm. And it was all he talked about the whole time. We all ate the same foods. He's the only one who thought stuff wow. was yeah. And so it's that idea, and it's really yeah. hard to communicate that with someone because it makes them, it's like shaming. It's like you did it to yourself, you know? So yeah. it's just really interesting the idea mm. of, um, I think the placebo effect is really interesting. And then also these ideas, like you're saying, you went to him and he really helped you with your belief system and how that mm-hmm. was communicating maybe with your gut or your blood or fertility. Or, yeah. Um, so if you could expand, you know, on, on those ideas and studies and how maybe that can relate to introducing something like saffron into a lifestyle. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, What I heard you say, Chelsea, is that you have had 
a personal experience with your sweetheart where um, this trip that you went, he was very hyper vigilant about not, uh, not, not, being, um, not being well. And um, you feel that that level of hyper vigilance may have contributed to him ending up not being well. Um, one of the first books and, uh, that was written in Mind Body Medicine is by Joanne Borzinko. Uh, the name of the book is Minding, um, Mending, Minding the Body, yeah, M Minding the Body, Mending the Mind. And she started a clinic, I, I think it's called Mind Body Clinic at Harvard, but something to that effect. Um, in the book, she cites about, I can't remember, I think it was a family member, maybe an uncle or, I can't remember. But it was a family member that was allergic, th thought that they were allergic to cheesecake or, or cheese, <laughs> right? And one time, you know, this person comes over and, and her mom may have, or aunt may have, made this cheesecake. So, you know, this person is eating it, enjoying it. He says, wow, this is, wow, what a dessert. This is great. Everything is fine. And a couple of hours later, they tell him that, you know, it was cheesecake. And all of a sudden, he feels nauseous, and he's rushing to the restroom to vomit, right? As I shared with you, I've spent over 11 years of my life looking at this connection. And the connection is not a direct connection. The connection is not a goes to B and then C and ends up as Z, okay? Every human being is different. Um, I'll give you some cases uh, that are especially related to saffron. I had this, um, this um, litigator, um, attorney, that was you know, dealing with um, a depression. Now, this, is, this was extreme level of depression, recalcitrant depression. And he had been everywhere, and he had done all the anti, you know, all the uh, psychotropic medication that includes antidepressant, antipsychotics, and so forth. And he had three um, uh, treatments of what's referred to as ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, which is shock therapy, right? Uh, one flew over cuckoo's nest, right? And he had that, and it was ineffective, right? He comes in, and believe it or not, he's off of all his medications and he's on saffron tincture, and he's, he got married, and um, hmm. um, you know, he got married, and, they're, you know, and he's planning on, uh, anyway, it just, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to see that. But it's, um, the, one of the reasons that my, most of my research background was um, in neuro-ophthalmology. Initially, I wanted to become a neuro-ophthalmologist, and I, my fellowship was at Doheny Eye Institute. Back then, it was through USC, and now it's affiliated with UCLA. And my mentor was um, Alfred Sedun. And we looked at various different things. One of the things that we looked at was in early 1990s in Cuba, there was a blindness epidemic. And, um, and what was fascinating, when you look at the map of Cuba, okay, Guantanamo Bay is down here, okay? And as, as um, you got closer to Guantanamo Bay, this blindness epidemic would decrease. So, you know, Cubans, they were saying, oh, this is the United States doing it. Look, as it gets to Guantanamo Bay, the rate is decreasing and so forth. So they sent two of the neuro-ophthalmologists to Cuba. And one of the two was Alfredo Sedun. And Alfredo had gone and he had, and he had decoded what was occurring. On this end of the island, this was the place where they made all the bootleg rum. And at the time, because of the embargo, they weren't getting enough of the animal products, so they were very low on B12, folic acids, and, and so forth. So what was occurring as, as, as they uh, trucked the bootleg rum, it would decrease as they would get closer to, to Guantanamo Bay. So the people that they were drinking the bootleg rum, they were literally flushing out all the essential nutrients, such as B12, mm -hmm. out of their body. And it was creating um, optic atrophy or blindness. Once that was determined, then they put people on you know, the appropriate nutrients, B12 and folic acid, and they got their sight back. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this was a documented case, and we actually published it. But what we did was we looked at it within the RAT model, and, uh, and, we, and it was published. What I'm trying to tell you, there are things that they're so intercalated that when it comes to nutrients, okay, nutrition, as well as the way and the belief system that you have, that they're so intertwined with a person's biography and culture that you can't separate it. A good way, like for instance, you know, in this specific model that you brought forward, a uh, particular setting, I, I appreciate you not wanting to create a culture of mind shaming your beloved or making him feel conscious or guilty. However, you could create a discussion, a dialogue. You see, you mind shame when you want to funnel feed the other person. You mind shame when you want to give them advice. Advice giving is a monologue, not a dialogue. Mm -hmm. A dialogue is, gosh, what's his first name? Max. Max. Okay, let's just say Max. And you, know, you say, well, gosh, Max, I'm just really curious that throughout the trip, this was really important to you. And gosh, isn't that interesting that out of all of us, the five, three, four, five, seven of us, you were really the only one that, that, that experienced this, you know? And, and I'm, you know, gosh, I'm reading this book by Bruce Lipton called The Biology of Belief that came out in early or mid 90s or early 2000s. And it just talks about, you know, we attract what we believe. We attract what we think about. Now, I love you, and you're important to me, and, you know, we're, I, you know eventually we're together, and we're maybe starting a life together, and, you know, and I know that the way you think, and the way you feel, and the way you emote is going to affect me, and I love you enough to be able to speak straight with you, and to tell you that this is really present for me, and I would love to talk to you about it. Is that over a cup of saffron latte? <laughs> <laughs> is that, does, that, does, that, does that create enough of... Definitely. If we did have that dialogue, but I think the hard part then you get into like the reprogramming and how do you start to change your belief system because I think there's a lot of fear around that. If you change your belief system, you don't have identity. If you don't have identity, you die. So we continue the patterns. So I think the hard part is like the next step, which is what you're speaking to, which is just like thinking. Thinking and being in touch with him. Mm -hmm. And, you know... When you look at, uh, when you look at um, a, a, a ship, a boat, a ship, the way, that, the way that the steering of a ship, doesn't matter how big it is, right, it occurs not in the front, it's in the back. It's actually called a rudder, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you go to the side of the ship and you say, well, you don't want to go to Brazil, we want to go to Europe, let me push you. You can't do that, right? But you can change the rudder. Now, what you need to be mindful of, there are little tiny little things that, that they're sticking to the rudder, okay? That's called a trim tap. Moving a trim tap, it's very easy, okay? <laughs> so when you shift or change the trim tap, okay? Then it changes the pressure and then that's how you change the rudder. What you need to go into a conversation with, with Max is to find a trim tap. Okay, so when this a particular situation that's occurring, let's say now you want to backpack through India, whoa, right? And it might bring up a lot. But you could say, well, let's prepare for it. You know, let's just see we can be mindful in terms of the conversations that we would have or the things we would say to ourselves. And let's, at the end of each day, sit together and see how that's going for us, right? So you trim tap. And that's how you shift or change the direction of your biography that will dictate your biology. Yeah, of course. My privilege. Good question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about endometriosis and uh, turmeric. In that, sorry, saffron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's. Um, what is your first name? Jamie. Okay. So endometriosis. <clears throat> Let me create endometriosis for you because I think it's very important um, for you to see what, how I see endometriosis. Um, when you look at the pelvic floor and the inlet, there are tissues on the lining of the uterine cavity, okay, that they're very specific. Why? Because most, most women, they're unaware, but the uterus is actually uh, a, a detoxing agent. 
you pull and you attract significant amount of detox, mainly what's referred to as xenobiotics. Xeno, X-E-N-O, xeno means foreign. For instance, xenophobic, uh, people that they are afraid of, people that they're foreigners, right? Um, xeno estrogen or xenobiotic, they're chemicals that were bombarded and we're bombarded everywhere. Right now, the lights that they're using, if it's thallium based or if you're holding a laptop and it's tungsten based, the heat of it, it evaporates and you absorb it in your body. So the uterus acts as a sponge. You pull it in there and then as you go through the menstrual cycle, it proliferates and then it sloughs off and it'll get rid of all that toxin. Now, there are times that there is a hyperproliferation of the uterine cavity where these cells, they don't stay put and they start roaming around into the abdominal cavity. Then you have the, the cells of, of the endometrium moving into the abdominal cavity and it creates uh, the, uh, the model that we were traditionally, in the me medical model, we refer to as endometriosis, right? So there are two ways of approaching it. One way of approaching it is to look at the psycho-spiritual consciousness that leads into an intro endometrial movement of the cells into the abdominal cavity. That's one. And the other one, uh, and that is based on the anthroposophical principle where we believe that consciousness precedes phenotypic expression, meaning what Max thinks and holds here, the conversation that Max has here will affect his digestive enzyme, his innate immunity that will create sickness in Morocco. Consciousness mm -hmm. precedes phenotypic expression. That's a pillar. So when you look at that, not, not you, Jamie, but let's say a particular case that I had, very interesting case, where this person felt that their femininity and who they were as a woman was invaded and they had to hide inside and to continuously run away. That consciousness can create a setup, a physiological model that could lead into the endometrial tissues escaping and going into the abdominal cavity. Now, what's the medical model? Well, the medical model is what we've got. You attack it, you burn it, you, 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 know, you, you cut it out, great. And guess what happens? It keeps coming back. Because when you're looking at endometriosis, the quickest way to do that, it's at the consciousness level. And I believe that saffron has a role, and I've used it. I've used it in many models. I'm not advocating this for you, because obviously I don't know your, the entirety of your case. However, I can tell you what I have used in the past, which is um, you can use tincture, you can use it in terms of oral um, application, and I have also used it in various different suppositories that they used, wow. okay? I've used it and based it in an oil that they use as a lubricant on their, part, on their partner during intimacy, so that as they're intimate, all the inner lining gets absorbed and with incredible success. Wow. Does that, is that answer? It seems like it would help, absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Of course, because anti-inflammatory, and uh, the it, it, saffron has new, what's referred to as neuroendocrine effect. Neuroendocrine effect. Never forget that because when you're looking at endometriosis, you got to look at it. In, you you got to look at a neuroendocrine effect. You got to look at the consciousness, nervous system, neuro, and the hormone. But the medical model, guess what it does? It's a hormonal approach, mm -hmm. and they're missing 50% of the model the way I see it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Start with Hi. your name, please. I'm Laura. Laura. Hi, Laura. I'm a, a practitioner of Chinese medicine, and oh. I specialize in women's health, but saffron is not part of our material in America, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about dosing in the tincture form and how that equates to dosing in the latte form. Because mm -hmm. I feel like my patients would love the latte. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. like yes. But yeah. I would want to make sure that they were getting it. Absolutely, yeah. I have a lot of respect for uh, the uh, traditional oriental medicine 
because it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things what I, I started my conversation with. The way that I practice medicine, uh, it's system way of approaching, right? And obviously, over 5,000 years history, that's what they worked with. Now, saffron was not an available herb at the time because you see each... I should have brought it. I, uh, my, I asked my mom, she just came over from Iran, and I said, can you just get me, go to and so-and-so's farm? Mm -hmm. and, and she brought a bag of saffron, right, and that they pluck. What they do is it's, it's a very labor-intensive herb because each of these is stagmata. They have to literally pick it, right? I mean, they go through 80,000 pounds to be able to get you, you know, a pound of saffron. Right. So I think because of that, perhaps um, it, it was it, it was never really introduced into the materia medica mm -hmm. um, of the Chinese medicine, m medical model. That would be my the same thing that when you look at the um, the traditional uh, Persian um, uh, medical approach, uh, the way that it was approached by Avicenna in the canon of uh, medicine. Um, which is still used as at Harvard, Oxford, and so forth, they never talked about ginseng because it wasn't available at the time. But ginseng w within that model, it's, you know, it's an adaptogen and it's used. What I have found, and again, one of the things that I want you to take with you is that every case is unique, right? 7.85 billion on the planet, you know, they're going to... So my philosophy is start low and go slow. So I usually start with... You know, I've start use, I would use maybe 10 to, to 15. Um, for s most people, I would start with 30 milligrams, okay? The way that m most of the time, the way that I approach it, though, is in tincture, right? And the beauty of a tincture is it's sort of, as you know, um, it's sort of like uh, a sponge. You put a drop of water on it. it. It absorbs what it needs. The rest of it gets washed off. Um, and I, I use um, saffron with different herbs. I mix it with different herbs and so forth. And when it comes to the brain, then I use it. I usually use it within the model that they have um, orally, and I mix it with um, some type of fat, either dairy or coconut base, because, because of the lipid solubility, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And to give, we have, this one actually has 150 milligrams. Which is, I don't think you understand yeah. what that is. Like, her really, wow. her latte. I mean, it's just understand. It, and, and it's, look, the, uh, and you might say, well, that way, uh, no, no, no. You're not going to get giggly. And God, who, I mean, we really, what we need is we need gigglies <laughs> right now in, in the globally, really. We need a lot of global gigglies. But what I want you to understand is, when what you start your day with, it sets your entire day. See, the reason that you go to a restaurant and you sit down and they bring you some starch, why do they do that? It's intentional. Because when you start with the bread or olive oil and this or that, the, 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 it's a lot easier for, because you get a surge of insulin. So the chances of you feeling fuller quicker, it increases which simply means now all of a sudden they're going to turn you into a billboard. Now you're going to be carrying a bag and a doggy with their name on it. That, mm -hmm. oh, wow, she ate there. <laughs> that must be really good. So the quickest way to be able, you got to be able to think. you got to be able to think for yourself. When you wake up in the morning, okay, it's incredibly important to be able to hydrate yourself first. And this would be one of the things that you could have in the morning. Instead of being pumped up with coconut and caffeine that, well, yeah, you, oh, yeah, you're not going to feel hungry. Wow, man, yeah, of course you want to just pump. But I'll tell you, five and seven years down the road, now all of a sudden, you know, look, there, there's a reason that there are religions that caffeine is outlawed because they know the power of it. Because it goes in and it, it increases the, you know, and then it allows you to be more um, careless and more explosive and not to be able to be more methodical and centered. And it gives you false energy and energy that at the end of the day, you pay a price for it. See, I don't believe in a particular diet. I believe in you, human being. You are out there. And you should be able, you shouldn't be eating coconut that was made in Thailand. 
It's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. You know, I mean, you give me a, I'll give you a case. A, this person, incredibly allergic. They were allergic to everything, everything, everything. And I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your local um, farmer and if they have a hive or find a beehive uh, that, that they cultivate their own honey around your area and I want you to have a tiniest amount in some hot water every day. They did it. It worked. Very intelligent human being. Very intelligent. Um, researcher at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is the lab for NASA. He said, could you walk me through the reasoning for this? I said, absolutely. Here's the reasoning. The reasoning is that bees are moving around and they're picking up all the allergens and pollens and they're digesting it and including it in the honey. So when you eat the honey that was made around your area, you are you're creating a homeopathic approach, which means you're eating a lower dose of the very toxin. If you eat a lower dose of toxin, you build up immunity. What does that mean? That means that, uh, let's say, um, Chelsea and, and Max, if they have a, a very small amount of tiny arguments, the chances of the longevity of the relationship goes up. Mm -hmm. But if she holds her breath, she says, oh, I can't say that, I can't mind shaming my hand. And they're going to India. Now they're on a train and they're sitting there. And he says, you know, God, there's a, she's just going to explode, <laughs> right? And she's going to pack her bag and she's going to say, I'm, I'm done with you. And she's just going to uncouple and interrupt me, right? <laughs> That's what we're talking about. So to be able to do that, to be able to think, think for yourself, think to be able to think through what is occurring. And you can, you know, believe it or not, you actually know what's best for you. You can ask. And you, you know, ask and it shall be given, right? Knock and it shall open, right? Matthew, John, Luke, 168 places. I mean, if it says, if it keeps repeating it, it must be true, or at least there might, you know, at least think about it. So, but if you, in order to do that, you gotta, uh, you know, you gotta get off of the mediated media, media, it's mediated, it's fake, it's not real. You gotta get out of the social media, this unrealistic world. And you gotta be able to tune in so that you have this connection with you, that wisdom within you. That whatever you want to call it, you want to call it Ruha HaGodesh, or you want to call it soul, or you want to, whatever you want to call it, there's something there, okay? Now, you can pick something up, or you can think about something, and there is a particular feeling, or thoughts, or a visceral reaction that develops. You call it gut feelings, whatever it's, it's called. But you've got to fine-tune it. You could go, and you don't have to take what's recommended, because it's 150. You could just hold it. And you could say, what would be for my highest good? What? What? I could just ask that? Yeah. Yeah, you don't need Dr. Sudegi. You don't need this other person. You don't know. You can tune in and you'll know what is for your own highest good. You start low and you go slow and just see how you feel. And then you realize, wow, it's around my cycle and I'm craving this. Great. Eat that. <laughs> Not because so-and-so wrote a book and says, oh, ever, for every time that they say ever, forever, don't, no, just like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's, you know, and then they want to sell you something, right? That's, I'm not part of the conversation. I don't have any interest in this whatsoever. And I was very straight with you, okay? I, what I am interested in is the thought process. I'm interested in the idea that our food can be our medicine and our medicine can be part of our food. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. For, and, I mean, I think we're kind of getting short on time, but if anyone had a dying question, they had one more. Um, yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank, you for, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your quality of listening. I'm very grateful. Thank, thank you. Thank you for showing up for us. Yeah, of course. I love you. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you.